five years ago was the beginning of a new season, unique season in my life, marked by trials which I value for the perseverance and grace that I have learned by them and by the love of my Heavenly Father I continue to learn. You see, because God's getting more of me every day as I'm being purified. There are sufferings in which I found peculiar and particular consolation, as through deep pain God speaks to me, love not the world or the things that are in the world. Amen. He places the imprint of his image more deeply into my heart, and painful as this may be at times, it is more than matched by joy and accompanied by a sweet relief found in increased trust and confidence in God. The pain is only there because of sin-stained influences, and that pain tests spiritual fortitude and reminds me not to cling in any way to that which is passing away. I do not speak of things uh, such as the love of money or, you know, very, very uh, obvious things that I'm being purified of these days. Rather, I'm talking about grief and suffering that is like a raging fire, can be like a deep and turbulent sea or an arid desert. And there are thoughts and feelings that I've encountered through those things that I would never have had to deal with except for that I went through those things. I'm talking about purification of things that are not so apparent to other people, but that are quite deep, that rest deep in the soul, things that the Lord is purging from me and also showing me such a deep fellowship with him in those things. You see, salvation, I found, is like a large house. And I thought the room was large when I came in the door some 23 years ago, but I keep finding more rooms and I'm increasingly living in more of the house. What I want to testify to you today of regards the things in which I see the Lord teaching me and I see that he knows very well how to teach me. Do you know what I mean? The Lord has made us each in various ways. He knows how to teach us. He knows how to be gentle when we need him to be gentle. He knows how to prepare us for things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to accept. He knows how to, be, um, to cut right to the heart and make us receptive to it. Now, I found in, uh, in my short life, I've noticed people often, they want to see miracles, but they don't want to live so as to need them. And I've never asked for miracles, but let me tell you, I've seen miracles. And the Lord's brought about miracles in and around me. And I'm thankful because it shows his divine intervention working in, in everything and I don't mind living, so I need a miracle. Because trust in God isn't just something we do when we know what things are looking like and how they're going to turn out. True trust in God is knowing he's there no matter what. He's working it out, and I don't have to see every little step of the way. So I'd like to give you some examples in my own life how the Lord started working these things in this particular season five years ago. I start with a miracle that confirmed my faith in God's provision. Now, I've always trusted in the Lord's provision. I won't say that's never been tested. It has. But the Lord will bring you to a place where he keeps saying, I know you trust me. Trust me more. I know you're leaning on me. Lean on me more. You know, there's nothing quite so heavy as a dead body. Well, we're dying to self. We're dying to the flesh. The more we do that, the more we lean on the Lord. Now, in 2009, my uh, sister Pam died. And this meant that I was traveling from California to Joplin. I was going to drive from Joplin up to the Chicago area, attend that funeral, and come back down, spend some time 
with my parents and the brethren here. And it, at that particular time, my father, Brother Given, was having horrible back pain. And they had told him he had degenerative bone disease. And every night he had been having quite a bit of pain, hadn't you? And uh, he wasn't able to go to the funeral. So that was, that was difficult enough as it was. And it was upon returning from Chicago, getting back to Joplin, that on the phone with my husband, Brother Jason, I found out that he had been fired from the church we had been ministering. The church we came to California to pastor. And so a rush of things were going through my mind. One was just the grief of the fact that I wouldn't even be going back to see some of those people. I'd already been scheduled to speak at several of their events, and I'd been teaching a women's Bible study that had started out as a small group, ended up being 40, 40 women and more, very hungry and eager for the truth. So I was grieving those things, and I was also quite concerned about how we were going to make it. But at the time, I'd been looking for, for work for about three months. And uh, that, among many other things, which uh, are quite tender that I, I won't share at this time, um, this, this caused me to grieve very hard. And I wept bitterly until about 3 o'clock in the morning. I got this news late in the, in the night as it was. But I could see I was not going to be able to go to sleep. Now, this is very unusual for me. I don't think I had ever experienced this before. And I came to the point, I just cried out to God. And I said, God, I need, I need to be able to go to sleep. I need to be able to deal with this. I do trust you. I have this concern. I don't know how this is going to work out. And I'm going to ask you something, Lord. I'm going to ask that if you're going to take care of everything, and God knew what I meant by that, that my father wouldn't have any pain tonight. Because he had been telling me how much pain he had been having. Now, at the same time as I'm praying this, I'm thinking, why am I praying this? I mean, I don't want him to have pain. I am trusting the Lord, and yet I, I felt the need to reach out to God in this way. And that subsided my anxieties, and I was able to rest peacefully. Now, the following morning was also pretty, pretty difficult, but I had been scheduled to have lunch with Dad. And I, I went up to his office. He had prepared a lovely lunch for us. And the whole time we're eating, I'm thinking, when am I going to tell him about Jason being let go? So my heart was quite heavy as I'm sitting there and we're talking. And before I had the chance to tell him anything, he said, well, I didn't have any pain last night. <laughs> and he must have wondered what happened because I think I broke out in tears at that point. And I, I told him this is what I had prayed. Well, it wasn't long after that that he went back, Brother Given had gone back to the doctors, and he hadn't been having any pain. I found out that the Sunday before this happened, he had been in so much pain, he had been weeping, and the brethren came forward and laid hands on him and prayed for him. And that since that point, he hadn't had pain. That happened on a Sunday. The news I received happened on a Tuesday. Later on that week, I believe it was, that when he went to the doctor, they told him, you have a spine of a 30-year-old. And when I found that out, I realized why God asked me to pray that. He was already ahead of that. He already did it. He already healed him. In fact, he did something more than just what I asked. I asked, no, don't have pain. He healed him before the point in which I asked for that confirmation. So if that doesn't boost a person's confidence, it certainly did for me. And what I found in that is the Lord was reassuring me at the time I needed it. I didn't turn away from him in my questions or my concerns. What I found is going right to the Lord. He knows how to show you what he's doing. He knows how to reassure your heart. And the best thing to do is just take it right to him. Now, after that point, both 
Brother Jason and I were un unemployed, both looking for work. Like I said, I've been looking for work for about three months. So uh, I started cleaning houses just, just to get some kind of income. And we only had a, a little bit, you know, stowed away. And every time I had to go to the store, that was a burden. Because every time I had to spend more money, I was taken out of what little we had. And every time I went, I prayed. And I kept being given this verse. You've heard it many times, but it became especially precious to me at this point. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be fulfilled. And I would remember the healing. I remembered God, the prayer I had prayed, Lord, if you're going to take care of this, I would remember the healing that Brother Given had because, see, that was, that was like a, a sign to me. Because I knew God wasn't obligated. God is not obligated. We could live without our house. We could live without these things. But the Lord reassured me these things would stay intact. So it was about three months after being uh, after Jason had been let go that I found a per diem job with San Diego Hospice. Now, I, I'm a chaplain. I was looking for chaplaincy work. I found a per diem position. I knew it wasn't going to be that much. I didn't even know if they were going to hire me because the hospice I was applying to was the largest hospice in the States, and they generally don't hire people who haven't had previous experience. But I put in my application. As it happened, when they called me back for the interview, not even a week later, they said, well, did you know that there's a full-time position too? Do you want to apply for that? I said, yes, put me down for that full-time position. Two weeks later, I was hired full-time, San Diego Hospice and the Institute for Palliative Medicine. Now we had a little bit more money. We were able to stretch it, but we were coming up um, the following year in April. Come March, we weren't going to have any more money for our rent. So, <laughs> gives you good opportunity to pray. <laughs> Lord, we know what we have in our hand. We're asking you to provide for what is yet to come. There was a man in the church that we started attending uh, that said, came to Jason and said, you know, I'm, I'm a manager for Unilever and I feel like the Lord's calling me to employ you for the position that I need. And he was able to obtain the job. We received his first check the day before our rent was due. Now, I consider that a miracle of sorts. I, I certainly do. Needing what, what the Lord would give and seeing him give it, being faithful in what he promised. Now, in the meantime, our ministries at the church we were attending, uh, those things were developing. I had started a women's ministry called Partakers of Grace. That was increasing and growing. I was developing relationships and ministry with San Diego Hospice, with my teams, with the families I served. And uh, I was seeing and speaking of grief and diseases, challenging family dynamics, that things that were kept only in my prayers and with my team members because of the need for confidentiality. But I was learning very much through that process. I've seen people through a lot of different diseases. And again, I was able to observe people want miracles, but they don't want to live as if to need them. And then there are people that don't believe in miracles, and when they need one, they're hopeless because they don't believe in miracles. And then there are people that believe the Lord is able to do miracles, and they receive those miracles, some physical and seen, and many others that are unseen in their lives. At that same time, we were able to buy the house that we had been renting, and I was grateful to be able to fix that place up, and we took a lot of joy in being able to live there. It was a sort of sanctuary for us during some difficult times. Now, in Several years later, in 2012, strained uh, relationships between the pastor and uh, Brother Jason occurred, also with myself, 
over some unfortunate things. And that resulted in a departure that was most painful from that church. After which, as a matter of fact, we were somewhat slandered from the pulpit. So, and, and that was, that was again, there was a departure that happened and I had to grieve that. And I had to trust the Lord. He was going to open up another door. He was going to make another way. See, I've learned about myself that I grieve a lot when I don't have control. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I like to be able to have control. And so in that way, I find the Lord teaching me trust in him and learning to look to Christ as my stability, not in others, not in what others do or don't do. Because you see, during this time, after we had to leave that church, I was disappointed by uh, other believers and feeling as if they were, they were rather labile and undependable. And at the same time, I was kind of leaning on them. That's how I felt. I was leaning on them, but they weren't dependable. And I, I knew that I couldn't let that turn to bitterness. I needed to grow in, in looking at who am I truly leaning upon and so I found the Lord shift, kind of shifting my view, shifting my gaze in another direction. And what I learned to do through that actually is in whatever frustrations, and let me tell you, I had severe frustrations with certain people. I learned to take those straight to the Lord. Not dwell on them in my own mind, not talk to other people about them but go straight to the Lord. And a lot of my frustrations had to do with people making decisions that I knew wasn't good for their own spiritual health. So it wouldn't be right for me to take those godly frustrations and, and sin. So I found the Lord helping me to express these things to him and that in that I was able to intercede for people that probably in any other way, our fellowship could have been broken, but the Lord did not allow for that to happen. So I learned to take my frustrations to God. I learned to trust God to guide those who love him and to pray to that end. And I learned to diligently refresh myself in his word and take refuge in God and not my environment. Amen. This is very important. Amen. To learn to take refuge in God and not your environment. Amen. Environments change and we have to be able to thrive no matter what environment we may find ourselves. Now, there are environments that we would not choose. And if we have opportunity to flee certain environments, we should. But sometimes uh, we're found in situations not of our choosing. And the Lord can establish us so that we can thrive in it. Now, while these departures were taking place, it just so happens that our kitchen was also being gutted and the contiguous flooring in our house was all taken up and all the furniture was in different rooms. And again, my sense of control was unraveling. My home was not, it did not feel like a safe haven. I couldn't go in there and just relax. It was stuff everywhere. And for some, maybe that wouldn't be such a trial, but for me, it was. And I had to learn to be temperate in that to be stable in that, to not get angry, to not just run away, but to deal with that, because it was a long time. I mean, at least I thought it was. It was about six months or so. And I found that the Lord was able to keep me in that as well. And I kept running to him, running to him, running to him for refuge, for solace, for peace. Now, the Partakers of Grace Women's Bible Study was still continuing even after we left our congregation. And now we were collecting women of all different denominations and sources of uh, communities. People were coming just to hear the word and to pray. My hospice ministry deepened and continued. Eventually our kitchen and bathrooms were finished, so the house was back in order. And after the renewal last year, Brother Jason and I spoke the first time about moving back to Joplin. 
And we've been gone for 14 years. And, uh, you know, it sounded kind of good, but then we thought, how's that supposed to happen? <laughs> Not quite sure it's the right time for it to happen. We continued talking about it for several months, and I found humans have a great way of complicating things that God just knows how to God just knows how to set it straight. He knows how to open a door. He knows how to set a path. And he ended up doing that. The final de decision maker uh, was when I started seeing the, the hospice I was working for declining. And we kept having layoffs, layoff after layoff. Everybody was on pins and needles. And at one point, I found out that the branch I was working on was going to lay off an entire team. And I f could foresee that I was going to be laid off. Now this ended up sideswiping all my coworkers. They didn't think I would get laid off. But again, the Lord knows how to teach us. He allowed me to be prepared for that before it happened. And before it happened, I still wasn't sure. I still remember when I got the call that morning from my manager and she asked me to drive in and I, kn I just knew what it was going to be about. And before that I had prayed, Lord, if you need us to stay here in California, let me keep my job. But if, I, if we need to move on, because everything else, we had kept having ties cut with the church, with, with this and that, that just we were getting more distanced from the place we were living. So uh, I prayed that if we were meant to go back to Joplin, that I would take my losing the job as a sign, that that's what we needed to do. And sure enough, that is what happened. And that was my consolation in that. Because when you get that close to people, yeah, it's, it's not an easy transition to make to suddenly be taken away from them. But the Lord was able to give grace in that. And again, you learn, the Lord, the Lord is able to work things out, not just for you, but for other people. And there's still purpose in all of it. So, uh, so after the decline of San Diego Hospice, my being laid off, we set to selling the house. We decided to do that the week after I was laid off, actually. That was on a Thursday, and then Monday we put the house on the market. Long story short, uh, we got an all-cash offer for the full amount in, what, five days? It, it was done. So there was another confirmation. We had the new kitchen and new bathrooms that increased the house value. I was able to enjoy them for a little bit before we sold the house. And we paid expenses and came to be with my parents. Now this was a big decision because having been gone for 14 years, being a highly independent individual, my life goal was not to go and move back in with my parents. But, but I'm very grateful that it worked that way because we could not have come here otherwise. We couldn't have afforded to come here otherwise. So they have provided a safe haven themselves in allowing us to be here. Now, of course, after we got here, now we started the wonderful search for jobs. And anybody who's been through this knows it can be an incredibly fatiguing process. But it was in February that I received a call back from Via Christi Hospital in Pittsburgh. Jason had found a per diem job there, and as much as I didn't want to work nights and weekends, I was going to put my foot in the door. Again, similar to when I was at San Diego Hospice, upon the first phone interview, they said, you know we have a full-time position open. Would you like to apply? Yes, put me down for that full-time position. And I got hired full-time at Via Christi Hospital in Pittsburgh as one of their chaplains. At the first interview, they happened to tell me that the last hire they had took six months months. And it was the, my boss, one of the chaplains there, that told me this. And I said, P 
Peter, we're just going to pray the Lord expedites that process. Because I need it and you need it. And it was within the next month that I was, I was on board with them. So I was very grateful for that. So I continue to pray for God's provision. I continue to trust in him as my shelter and my stability. I seek to glorify him in my deeds. My deeds. Not to look to others' deeds. I mean, I, I care very much about helping others live holy lives. But ultimately, I can't control others' deeds. I must look to being holy myself. God is merciful to remind me of his deeds. And when I am seeking him, when attacks occur in my thoughts, questions of what will happen, he gives me faith to quench these fiery darts by saying, remember when? Remember when? Remember when I answered that prayer? Remember when I gave you that? Remember how that worked out? I prayed for specific confirmations, and the Lord did give me those confirmations. So he gives me those things to remember. I'll close with this. Grief teaches us to let go of what is temporal and to seek what is eternal if we respond in faith. Temporal things are marked by grief, and at some time we'll have to give them up. Better now than when Jesus returns. There are things that are right to grieve and leave behind, such as our sin. It's right to grieve it, and it's right to leave it behind. Miracles are like grapes from the promised land, which is a better country. God's provision always comes at the right time and in the right place. We may grieve, but God ministers a taste of eternal glory in the midst of our pain. So I may not see the ways God will provide all my needs, but it is only right to trust him. Bring on the impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. What good is my trust if it wanes when I am confounded? That is not trust. But I will be purified in trusting him alone. As he gets more of me, I am given more of him. Here's a prayer that I leave with you. Thank you, Lord, for never leaving me empty-handed when you take something back. I have to learn that I can thrive without certain people or without certain realities that I once thought to be necessities. Learning this, that I will always be learning it by your grace. It is a preparation for heaven to let go of what is good to obtain what is better. Thank you for your time.